thank you for that introduction and thank you all together for this <clears throat> very generous in, in, uh, invitation to, to come here. I think I read here years and years ago, but I do indeed belong in these, in these parts and it's an enormous pleasure and privilege to, to come back. Um, I'll read two or three poems that uh, have to do with uh, Salford, or at least Salford and Manchester. The first is a sort of translation. Um, two or three years ago, I was asked by Mime Calvati to contribute to an anthology of Fado poems, a Portuguese song, Fado, and we were given literals of various Fado songs. Um, I knew no Portuguese and still don't, and to my great shame, hadn't been to Portugal then. But one of the poems was, was in praise of Lisbon, <laughs> Lisboa Antiga. And I had took the liberty of transposing that into a praise of my hometown, <laughs> with you and Macaulay in mind, the dirty old town, <laughs> uh, Salford. <clears throat> so here it is. <clears throat> uh, a moment ago, Rebecca was worried about harking back for three years, but believe me, this that this harks back an awful lot longer than that. Um, the one salient fact you need to know or remember about Salford is that it used to be a port and that the ships came in 35 miles from, from Liverpool to Salford docks. Old town, old town, dirty old town, 35 miles from the sea, but from there to us, through the buttercup fields and the moss, the big ships crept and stepped up the great canal, trailing gulls, and believe you me, that was a sight to see. Dirty old town, smog in the mornings, the buses came like timid beasts being led by Master, the bus conductor, walking slowly ahead. And when we came home, wide-eyed from the glittering Christmas pantomime, oh, the lamps had halos of rain. The big ships passed, big as tenements, through the placid cows in the fields. And there was a lock we could bike it to, where the jovial, idle, singing sailors threw us oranges down that were meant for market in the dirty old town. And courting couples rode home on the top of the number nine bus from a Sunday walking out in the bluebell woods. Oh, armfuls of bluebells came down like streams from the slopes of the hills into the dirty old town. I've come from St Andrews where the uh, theme, uh, rightly, was the First World War. And a poem I didn't read there is one, if you don't mind, I'll read now, because it, um, it has to do with Salford, with Liverpool Street, really, with the bit of Salford that my grandmother grew up on, and from where her husband, Private J.W. Gleave, went to war and didn't come back. He was killed on the 30th of July, 1916, on the Somme. On the, outside the Mission Hall on Liverpool Street was a roll of honour, and it was put up in 1917, not after the war. And it listed all the men who'd enlisted street by street. And as they got killed or wounded, a little mark was put next to each name. And my grandmother walked past this thing day in, day out, until roughly 1940, when the Blitz blew the thing to bits. Um, I've just been to St Paul's Church took me a while to find it, Cross Lane. And in the porch of Cross Lane, Cross Lane Church is now, and beautifully, it's, it's a place where Orthodox Christianity celebrates, I think probably from Somalia, actually. But in the porch is a roll of honor. It's not the one, and it's, it's one that doesn't list the men street by street. But Private J.W. Gleave is actually listed there alphabetically. Um, it's a, a poem about that, and it's also a poem about ever going back to places that you knew because none of the streets is left, not one, except Liverpool Street. So it's a sort of elegy for those, it must be said, um, not very attractive streets unless you happen to live there, which I didn't, it's true, because um, they were bombed out of Liverpool Street and then... <laughs> Not very long ago, we, had, we have in the family album a postcard of that role of honour. 
Um, it came down to me from my grandmother with m lots of postcards of the First World War. And some while back, I got it blown up in, in, in boots so that I could actually see every street and read every name. And I copied out every street name and every man's name. Um, this is the result. So it's a sort of found poem, really. These are the men who enlisted. Streets. 27 from Waterloo Street, two from Barlow's Road, five from Blackburn Buildings, only one each from West Thompson Street, Cranbourne Street, Bright Street, Langshaw Street, and Gunn Street. These are not levels of fervour, only how many homes, unfit for heroes, had men and boys to give. Liverpool Street gave 55, among them six by the name of Olmark. And my mother's father, 8571 Private J.W. Gleave, from number 57, on the corner with Little Healy Street, that gave three. Private S. Cooper, Private J. Flanagan, Sergeant C.H. Taylor. Eliza Street likewise gave three, all Molyneux. Air Street gave four, three of them Andersons. There were all other ranks round here, nothing bigger than a sergeant. I counted 37 streets in a half-mile square, and of them, none are left. Not Ducey Place, not Brighton Place, not Willis Street, not West Joseph Street that gave Private G. Olive, Corporal F. Cassidy, Sergeant R. Seddon, Private T. McNulty, nor Albion Street that gave all three Bowkers. The bit of Liverpool Street is left that led to the abattoir, but not a home along it, nor a church, a mission hall, a corner shop, a stables, nor any pub but one, the live and let live, boarded up, and no list anywhere. I counted 221 men went from here to Happy Valley, nameless wood, Crab Crawl, Stuff Trench, Hell Blast Corner, and Dead Man's Dump. Don't misunderstand me, they were by no means all killed or wounded. It's, uh, it's just the enlisting. And the, the, the thing on the wall must have been to encourage the few who hadn't, I guess, if there were any. They joined up en masse, as I'm sure you know, in the first weeks of September 1914, all from the warehouses and the factories. That's why they were called the Powell's Regiments, because they all went together, fought together, died together. Um, this is almost an angry poem. It's called The Wreck, short for Recreation Ground. Um, there's a reference in it to an extraordinarily beautiful poem by Heaney, um, one of the uh, clearances songs in which he commemorates the loss of the chestnut tree that was planted when he was born and when they moved house the new occupants cut it down. He comes close to celebrating the absence itself. He talks about a luminous emptiness where the tree, where the tree was. The wreck. Back home and finding the wreck gone, flogged off, become a gated community. CCTV in every hanging basket, and identical shaven headed fat men aiming remotes, each at his own portcullis. How can I make of it a luminous emptiness, as Heaney did of his axed chestnut tree? It's a space stuffed full with hardware, loungers, and meat. At 30 paces, it lights up sodium white. Pit bulls prowl the wire. Oh, that man who stands at the bus stop all day long, and whatever number bus comes, he never gets on, but tells everybody waiting, it was all fields round here when I was a boy. Day by day, more and more, he's me. I tell them Miss Eliza Smythe left the wreck in trust to the town in perpetuity for the health of children, her line dying out. It was an old enclosure, quick set with hawthorn, and we lay there watching and waiting for our turn in a team game on the free ground under the open sky. 
Only the moon and stars lit up the wreck. Few still believed there was such a playing place. But yes, another elegy would be very nice. So remember all you like. Can we live on lack? Should have stopped them grabbing it. Should take it back. Sorry, this is a rather inelegant water bottle. <laughs> The next one is the title poem of this um, new collection called Elder. I'm very fond of elder trees. Uh, there's one local reference in it to which you'll get. Elder's a strange name because it seems to suggest uh, various uh, witch, witch um, sort of slightly sinister things. And there's a, a vertical shaft just outside Castleton in the Peak District called Elden Hole. Um, where somewhere around the end of the 18th century, it was supposed to be unfathomable, and they lowered some chap who had no option on the end of a rope to find out just how deep it was. I wrote a poem about him many years ago, um, but that's the reference in the middle of this poem, Elder. Because it lifts up and lays itself open to heaven, level, under sun or hail, and out of its warty tubes you can extrude the soft white marrow to blow darts down or finger your breath for pan. And because, if let, it will grace human habitations of a lowly and broken kind, shapes up nicely to its full never domineering height against a brick wall still standing, curtains a window hole, and altogether does well in places we have spoiled abandoned developments, the backs we don't care who sees. And its smell is of the low sort, like hawthorn and rowan, rank, damp, very much to my liking. And because elder that is kith and kin with eldritch, eld, and that shaft into Hades near Castleton, gives twice, in summer and in the autumn, flowers and berries. And women who remember and have the mother's recipe at home in a stained book pluck up an adolescent courage and return to certain locky let go to ruin, old corrugated sheds, old bunkers, frightened tristings, and wade in deep through willow herb and Michaelmas daisies and maiden themselves up again with the million cream florets and redden their fingers with the black row from the brimming, the overturning dishes of elder. Are we in? Um, w one poem from the previous collection, which, which is called Nine Fathom Deep, and the, the, the picture on the front is Gustave Doré's, one of his illustrations from The Ancient Mariner. And it shows you the ship, the cursed ship, being shoved along by the glacial spirit. And my eye was caught by the figures on the seabed, those uh, of the drowned underneath it. And there's a, there's a couple there, lying there, a man and wife, or a pair of lovers, uh, asleep, rather. And I focused, I focused on them and thought that if there was any hope of redemption, it, it might come uh, through them. Nine fathom deep after Gustave Doré, after Coleridge. Couched where they are on the seabed, they feel no colder for the draft of the ship and the glacial spirit passing over them. Lucky you, say the living dead, to have got into the harbour of one another's arms, not having lodged behind your lids the rotting sea, the dead hands working, nor conceived remorse, remorse, the canker. Love, luckier still, we shall imagine this pair nine fathom deep, a dreaming one dream, the hooves of nightmare are battering round and round in their encircled hearts. But they wake, they open, and the crime dissolves. No one needs shriving. Nobody must trudge through the frontiers of a sickened world, spouting horrors. 
But by these lovers waking, the good ship sets her sails, the ice opens, and ahead goes the white bird, friendly and clever, and is the selfsame bird we every morning called, and it came and showed us more than we deserved what grace is like, wheeling on wings, very near, very high, very near again. Oh, on the strength of this, the man and woman waking and their astonished eyes, viewing a clean ship whispering down the arcades of ice, with a kick will freshen the sea, unharm the inhabited earth, and surface like flyers in a rush of bubbles. And every man jack of us will imagine children at home he will go on his knees to and be level with, and into whose wide eyes and open mouths he will tell tales as true and nourishing as loaves and fishes. Um, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll go a bit nearer that Eldon Hole, um, Cavedale. Uh, there's a particular beauty about Castleton in that you can be walking along the street, and you, I should be able to find it in a dream, if not in reality. You suddenly turn off right through two shops, and there's a kind of stream, a dried stream coming in. So the exit out of the town is up a stream bed onto the, onto the moors, or contrariwise, you can come right into town without actually losing touch with the, uh, with the moorland. Cavedale. I was dreaming about the place you told me about and woke, continuing. All the darkness long, the cave dale, as you said, entered the town between two ordinary shops, and there I lay like a figure in a frontispiece of visions, and that dark tunnel off the uplands entered my labyrinth, and all the mysteries of water in the limestone country were given me, the caves, the swallow holes, the sudden vanishings and fresh resurgences many mile away. But best, Last night I saw the high bare places after rain, when for a while on the green grass lying in hollows shaped for it, between the dry stone walls transfigured from grey to white, under the sun, under the blue sky, the silver waters shine. Dreaming with my ear to the place of entry of the long cave dale, I felt I could go in under the hazels and begin the climb and rest on handholds soft and damp with moss, ferns on my face, an owl preceding me, and one of the rivers of paradise under my feet, under the scooped and polished bed. I felt I would arrive where you said you had stood and wept to see the waters and a children's sky dancing with lapwing. We will go, won't we, while there's time. We'll wake before the sleepers in this ordinary town and I will show you what I've learned, which is the limestone secret climbing out of here. I sleep badly. I want more of the dark that has the light in it, like Blue John. But now in daylight, I must lick up my dream like a placenta before the crows get it. Blue John, as you know, is the floor spa that you can buy, find indeed. Once I found a mine they hadn't either finished or ever got at <laughs> years ago. Um, the older you get, the more friends you lose. Um, I've noticed that the death of somebody close uh, leaves you in a state of peculiar sort of um, sympathy for the rest of the world and a sort of patience, a greater kindness really, for a while. For a while after a death, I live more kindly to the world and on myself also am kinder. I see that things I have thought bad, how glad of them the dead would be to have the option of weighing better and worse, how searchingly they would look for the good side. Today on the bus, when I saw a young woman see in the look she got, 
this day of leafing and birds building, how wintered she looked. I felt a cold draft from the state the dead inhabit, who have no chances anymore. And under my breath, I begged her to be kinder, to believe the self she was charged with, meagre at present, could still flourish. All this ordinary day, I have had the company of my dead friend, whose last acts and words were all of a kind to leaven every gift in us. I have felt him whispering, watch for the good, and that I look out for him too, since I have the eyes. So I tend his life, and he will freight me with it kindly until I fail him. Sorry, I shouldn't be fiddling around like this. The clock at the back is completely useless. It's a, I think I've got about five minutes. Boss. Yeah. Um, another bad sign is um, constantly going in museums and writing poems about things you see in museums. Um, this actually was a, a museum in Basilicata, which is in southern Italy, and there's a tomb in the, enclosed there in glass, which is the tomb of from 6th century BC, and it simply says it's, a, it's the tomb of a lady, una donna. Um, una donna. Lady, in the rubble of you, in among the unstrung vertebrae and bits of rib, and in the vacancy of sex and womb, and either side your skull, which looks as frail as a sea urchin denuded by the sun, Ivory, gold, and amber are lasting well. An even iron that rusts, an iron key, still lies intact where your absent right hand had grasped it. Woman, female of the human species, shape in the dirt, much like a form of life that sank into extinction, down to a bed of mud, and under centuries of drifting silt, and under millions of pressing rock, so many millions of years and more upheaving and eroding, till your poor slice of time comes back to light, and a fellow human stares, as though this were the worst of it, at your missing hand, and feels you left a grief behind that could not bear to think you'd go where you would not be loved and dressed you again for sovereignty in the gifts he had given you in amber, ivory, filigree gold, the earrings, loops of necklace, low slung belt and closed your hand on the key to some fit lodging, lady. Uh, where there's a nuclear power station, has also got these extraordinary 7th century, I think, tombs cut in the cliff. Uh, they're there at your feet, and you simply look at them. Um, and when I looked at them with my brother, sister-in-law, and wife, um, they were full of water. It had a funny effect, because you were looking down, and the water was disturbed by the wind, Hesham, rock tomb. These four sunk side by side in a rock table. Their shapes are filled with rain, and in the wind that blew their dust into the Pennine streams, they shiver so much we can't see how we'd look staring up at clouds, migrations, empty blue. Two more. Um, I, I sworn never to write a poem about poetry, um, and then this ended up as being sort of about poetry, and it's about poetry in the sense that it's, it's become kind of axiomatic with me that you can only make poems out of particularities, out of very particular things. Blake spoke of the holiness of minute particulars, that you focus on that. The better you do that, in a curious fashion, the better chance you have of your poem 
becoming figurative and therefore having general import. This poem is called The House. Uh, stanza, the word as you know means a room and in that sense um, this is a house of, uh, uh, of stanzas. But it's two houses, it's two completely specific houses that I could take you to or could have taken you to. The house. You won't forget the house, will you? I never will. The south wind rattled the sash and rain came in on the sill and the wind denuded the moon white and the white of the tide wheeling into the wind lifted, showed and frayed and the sun came out of the sea and all that way across easily found the house, the bed, the looking glass. Remember the house so well that somebody else elsewhere will say, we had a house the same as where you were, but a hundred miles from the sea, and it was the north that blew, and the sky was as sheer as steel, and everything flared and flew. Stubble went down the wind, the oaks were filled with a voice, and the stars in the Milky Way screamed like a slide of ice and the sun that found our bed rose over oaks and a hill. But the house was surely the same, except for the sash and the sill. And there was a looking glass, and though they were mine and hers, the faces shown by the sun might have been hers and yours. You remember it all so well, that except for the south and the sea, that was surely the house, except for her and me. And I'll, I'll, I'll finish with another very local one, a, a poem that I wrote many years ago and then didn't publish at all until the very dear man in it had died. Not that I really feared he would be very offended because he had a good sense of humour. And again, I guess everybody has an Uncle Norman and this is my Uncle Norman uh, poem and it harks back to Salford Five where I've just been wandering rather desolately <laughs> around. Um, called Photo. They should never have photographed my Uncle Norman on a background of the Alps. The comparison was one he could not win. Somebody must have said, let's have one of Norman, and perhaps we can get the Alps in too. He would have been better in a dark interior. He could make any room convivial. He could tell stories by the hour. But here he is, smiling on an alpine meadow, ten years after we buried him. And we say it's a good one of Norman, now that he has given up what little breath he had. And so it is a good one, that is how he was, short and cocky. Alas, the meadow would have looked better without him. Though the back kitchen in Salford Five looked worse, and the back parlour at the Live and Let Live. He was all right in some little habitation among the back streets dwarfed only by gasometers and All Saints Church, the Empyreum, miles out of sight above the friendly fog. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>